Okay. All well, right. let's do that then. Let's do it that way. So this will be excited. This, this is very exciting. exciting. Yeah, thanks for All doing right. this. This is great. Okay. So I got every well, I think I got everything I need whenever you're ready to get started. All right, let's just jump right into it. So uh, today we are interviewing uh, Dr. Robert Kessinger, uh, who I know is a national speaker, lecturer, uh, teacher, at a chiropractic internist program. Uh, Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, experience, credentials, uh, specialties? Uh, give us a little bit, a little, little more detailed background on yourself. Okay. Uh, first off, I'd like to say I, I walked in the door a while ago and my daughter said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting ready to do an interview. And she said, she's 11 year old daughter. And uh, she said, what are you doing it on? I said, well, we're going to talk about the mitochondria. She says, that sounds fun. And 11 year old daughter, I said, what do you know about the mitochondria? She said, dad, I'm a homeschooler and my parents are doctors. I said, okay, fair <laughs> enough. All right. So I graduated Logan Chiropractic College back in 1988. And I spent much of the 90s doing upper cervical work. That's still my uh, primary technique. And so I did that exclusively through the first 10 to 15 years of my practice. And then uh, through different things, my dad was big in the DAPSI program, the chiropractic internist program. So there's some genetics probably involved in there. But I, uh, I picked up that mantle and uh, became a DAPSI about seven or eight years ago, which is a chiropractic internist. DAPSI stands for the diplomate in the American Board of Chiropractic Internists. So I function primarily as a chiropractic internist now. And yeah, I've had the, I've had the opportunity to speak a lot of places. And I love talking about life, talk, like talking about health and things that help people improve and, and get better. So uh, those are pretty much the credentials now. I am a primary teacher in the DAPSI program now. And I have been doing that for about five years. Uh, five or six years, somewhere, somewhere in that, that, uh, that background. And one last thing, uh, my one-year-old daughter is now sleeping in my little office room in my house. So I am doing this from her nursery. Oh, very nice. <laughs> you very see nice. it in the background. So, well, there's a, there's a six-year-old puppy around the corner from me. So we may have some, <laughs> we'll see, we'll around. see what happens. We'll see what happens. That's we'll see cute. how this plays out. So, uh, not all of our audience uh, might be familiar with a chiropractic internist. Could you explain a little bit about what does that oh, great. mean? Great, thank you. A chiropractic internist, really, I would say we wear uh, two hats. Uh, one of the hats is what I would call the systems biology approach in restoring health. What does that mean? Well, um, functional medicine is a fine title. That's fine. Uh, my only issue would be with it is that functional medicine uh, can really mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And uh, it's all good stuff. But uh, I think sometimes there's differing definitions of what that means. I like to say systems biology approach to health and wellness and uh, restoring from disease. And what that means is we go through the process of um, going through the systems, seeing what works and what's not working, anything from blood sugar, infections, nutritional, you know, whatever needs to be supported so that the body can have a better ability to heal itself. So that's one of the things we do, work through that model. But the other, as a chiropractic internist, it's about internal diagnosis and disease and so on and so forth. So we really function as a primary care physician. So when patients come in, I might have somebody that comes in with autoimmune I might have somebody that comes in with diabetes, or I might have somebody, we have a lot of Amish people uh, that come in that they have a lung infection or they feel like they have a lung infection and I'm going to evaluate them to see if they have pneumonia. Do they need to uh, be sent on somewhere with some heavier duty, maybe, you know, um, you know, uh, antibiotics or whatever, or something that we can handle through our model or whatever. So, so we have patients come in pretty much from, from cradle to grave with all kinds of different conditions. And the internist part is the part of the evaluation so that when people come in, we're trained to the level of really understanding what needs to be in our office and what doesn't. And one other thing I would say about that is that we're really the kind of the contractor. We are the, uh, the, the hub of care. So somebody comes in, I might send them out for a neurological consult. I might send them out for some imaging. I might send them out even for an oncological visit, but they're still my patient. We're we're the primary care physician that kind of helps guide them through this, through this web of, of healthcare. 
No, fair enough. I appreciate that much, much clearer. Uh, so I've had the privilege of hearing you uh, speak on different occasions, and I've heard you say something along the lines of, if you have a disease with a vowel in it, it stems from mitochondrial dysfunction. Huh. <laughs> well, actually, I would love to take credit for that, but uh, uh, David per Perlmutter, a neurologist out of California, has written a couple of really great books. I think one's called uh, Wheat Brain or something like that. But anyway, he he's written some books, and he actually coined that. He said, hey, if you have a disease and it has a, a vowel in the spelling, like diabetes has an I and an A and a couple of E's, so that would qualify he said it's a mitochondrial breakdown, a mitochondrial dysfunction. Now that might be an overstatement, but I kind of tell you, there's a lot, there's a lot to that. Okay. So this, uh, the topic of our talk today is mitochondrial dysfunction. Before we dive into the dysfunction part, uh, a brief overview, or maybe a, a not so brief, uh, tell us what mitochondria is and sort of why it's important and sort of lay the foundation of why the dysfunction might, might be an issue before okay. we dive deep into that. So Okay, so everything in the body is based upon energetics. So the body has to have the ability to have fuel to work. Every cell has to have fuel to work. And if you think about it, you know, we think in broad terms of physiology. We think of, we look at blood work, we look at different things, and we can see things floating around the blood. But when it comes down to it, all physiology takes place at the cellular level. And if the cell doesn't have enough gas, just like a car, it's going to run out of gas. It's not going to work well. So it's very interesting. We've known for years, 1988, when I graduated from Logan College, you know, they taught us it's the powerhouse of the cell, meaning that this is where we produce energy. We take food and make energy out of it. So, but now research is showing that the mitochondria do really a lot more. So there's a bioenergetic phase. I would say there's three big compartments of what the mitochondria do. One is the bioenergetics. That's where you're getting ATP. You know, you're taking a, a glucose and oxygen or you're taking ketones and you're producing fuel, right? So that's the bioenergetics. And the mitochondria have to have fuel, but the cell has to have fuel. If the cell doesn't have fuel collectively over a system, that organ's going to be sick, not going to be well. Collectively throughout the body systemic, you've got a person with chronic fatigue or whatever the case may be. They just don't have energy. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is there's a second thing would be biosynthesis. Now we're recognizing that mitochondria actually produce things. They actually will produce uh, hormones. Uh, they produce uh, things that will activate the immune response. Uh, they will produce things that will help proteins float through the cells properly through the endoplasmic reticulum. So the, 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 the mitochondria are very important in not just giving energy to the cell, but producing products. And the third thing that it does, and this is probably one of the most underlooked things that the mitochondria does, and that it is a powerful signaling agent. As we're learning, this is really wild, but as we're learning, it's so fun that in the 90s and in 2000, everything's hardwired, you know, to your computer, everything's hardwired. We didn't know what Wi-Fi was back in 1995, right? Everything's hardwired. As it turns out, the body has a lot of relationship with signaling. A lot of signaling is almost like Wi-Fi. So the system works on a lot of signaling principles. We use signaling for things like communicating with the microbiome. That's right, mitochondria. Every mitochondria at some level is going to communicate with the microbiome. It's going to uh, communicate with the other bacteria. As a matter of fact, if you look at mitochondria themselves, this is kind of just, I don't know. I, I, okay, I've heard this long enough that I'm not sure how long, far along it is with a theory. It maybe is considered a theory, but my understanding is in the evolving of the human system, the mitochondria actually used to not be there, but the mitochondria were developed from bacteria that were in our systems that began to work for our benefit and over time evolved into the mitochondria itself. So there's a lot of signaling that goes on with these mitochondria that has to do with our immune system, has to do with our hormone system, has to do with our autonomic nervous system. So its, it's impact is, you know, is far and wide, right? So how would you, uh, I guess, what do symptoms look like? If someone's going to say, oh, you have mitochondrial dysfunction, is it that every disease state or sort of, you know, imperfect functioning of our bodies related? To, or is there 
is there a way to actually say, no, these symptoms indicate mitochondrial dysfunction or is it everything? Yeah. Okay. So that's actually the way you, the way you asked that question was perfect. Uh, because yes, it's everything. It's, it's all the things that you just said, but let's, let's kind of unpack it a little bit. So let me just talk in generalities here first. All right. So if you have a patient that you've given them all of the latest whiz bang antivirals for Epstein bar or all of the things for Lyme, uh, they're chronically fatigued, um, chronic pain. A lot of these are from mitochondrial breakdown that's not been repaired. You can, okay, so I'm not against nutrition. Obviously, we do a lot of nutrition, but you can't nutrition somebody out of a bad mitochondria. There's very specific things you have to do. So I also say there's something called the squish test. Now, okay. if I'm ever... Uh, if I'm ever written up in a book, right, for orthopedics, we'll call this the Kessinger test. It's the squish test. Oh, I don't know if it's written anywhere. <laughs> if you can, if you can take somebody's, uh, go behind somebody's like uh, 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 their tricep and you squeeze it and it feels like a squish and not a hard muscle, then you might have low mitochondria, right? Yeah. Because if you're, you're, your muscles are laden with mitochondria, so is your brain. So if you have a breakdown of, of mitochondria, you're going to have weak muscles. Um, so weak muscles, sarcopenia, uh, chronic inflammation that you just cannot overcome, uh, chronic fatigue. These would be some of the presentations we may see or just simply can't get over something. Always having colds, always, have, you know, here's another one. Here's another perfect example. I think at the end of the day, we're going to see this all over the place, but long haul COVID, long haul COVID, I believe that you're going to find a relationship between breakdown of the mitochondria and inability to overcome. I think there's other things going on. We've seen some things with, um, they've got some nasty proteins in the CSF fluid uh, that, aren't, that are not properly processing. We have some vagal nerve problems with long COVID, but I also think we're also going to see, I said two also's, but we're going to see the mitochondria not being healthy and the cells do not have the energy to upright themselves. So I would say that would be a good generality of things that you might see. Chronic fatigue, uh, can't get over whatever that is, uh, Epstein-Barr, some kind of a virus, uh, you know, whatever these things are, Lyme disease, these things that we have a tendency clinically just to chase around like a dog chasing his tail. We just go around and around and around. We have to back up and say, what's the health of that mitochondria? Now, there's another part of that question that I absolutely love that goes right into the wheelhouse of really how I practice. And that's this, from a systems biology approach, I always want to know foundationally from a physiological standpoint, what the state of the foundations. In other words, there are some basic fun functions physiologically in the body. If we don't get them right, it's gonna be very difficult for us to upright and get better. I'll give you an example. There's three basic things. There's more than this, but the three biggies as it relates to the mitochondria. What is your blood sugar regulation? Do you have plenty of oxygen? And what's your oxidative stress? These are the three things that are going to have huge impacts. There's other things that I want to talk about through this presentation, but those are the three biggies. You give me somebody with a hypoglycemic. Uh, or a reactive hypoglycemia, they may look like they have normal fasting blood sugar. They could have 85, which is a perfect fasting blood sugar, but you'll see something like their lactate dehydrogenase, LD, LDH, you'll see it under 140, or you'll see that uh, when they eat food, it releases fatigue, or you'll see they get hangry, lightheaded, uh, jitters, um, you know, they get kind of trembly. Uh, brain fog. These are all classic examples of reactive hypoglycemia. If you have hypoglycemia, guess what? You don't have enough sugar for the cells to work. You don't have enough sugar for the mitochondria to have energy. So let me explain just a little further on that. And I, I don't want to rabbit trail this. I want to keep concise on this, but I have to rabbit just a little bit on this because it's too much, too important. I appreciate it. So when mitochondria work, there's a normal process of them making reactive oxygen species. They have to do that. It's a waste product. It just happens. It's part of the process, right? But here's the deal. 
when the mitochondria make enough energy, like having enough sugar and oxygen, they make enough energy, well, they have the energy to be able to process those free radicals in a safe way. You give me somebody with hypoglycemia, we're on the other edge. You give me someone with insulin resistance, they can't get the sugar in properly. I'm gonna show you somebody that is not making enough energy in the mitochondria. It's causing other problems for the cell, but let's just talk about what it does to the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria doesn't have enough energy to get rid of all these free radicals. And that starts this really bad, vicious cycle. When the mitochondria start going down, you start going down. That's what happens. You might not feel it, you might not have a disease, but over time you will go into a drift and it's a bad, vicious cycle. So I talked about blood sugar, oxygen. A very common thing is you'd be amazed at how many people I have come into my office and I do a basic blood test and see their ferritin is lower than 25. The red blood cells look fine. Hemoglobin looks fine. Hematocrit looks fine. MCV looks fine, but they're lower than 25 in ferritin. If that's the case and you have a patient like that, that's the earliest sign of iron deficiency anemia. Now, on the anemia package, I'll talk just briefly about this. We have so many things to talk about. But with anemia, you always want to look at the size of the red blood cell. If you have MCVs, which that's the mean corpuscular volume, that's how big the red blood cells, if they're really, really, really small, then we think iron deficiency anemia. And the number on there, I like to see is somewhere between 88 to 92 on your blood for your MCV, 88 to 92. But if it gets high, like at 98, 100, 104, then we think about low thyroid, maybe low B12, low folate, and then inflammation can actually make the MCV go anywhere. So there's gonna be big, there's gonna be the, the top five reasons for anemia would be those, would be iron deficiency, inflammation, low thyroid, low B12, low folate. So if you have anemia, those are some of the things you want, to, you want to look at. Also, if you just sedentary lifestyle, you don't move your body. If you don't move your body, you don't get circulation. If you don't have circulation, you don't get oxygen. You don't get oxygen, mitochondria is not happy. And the last thing I would say before we move on is this. Oxidative stress is a big deal. And it creates a vicious cycle for the mitochondria. If somebody has a chronic infection, if somebody is eating gluten and they're sensitive to it or any of them, maybe they're eating uh, beef or chicken or turkey or, or, or broccoli or whatever, cauliflower, and they're sensitive to it. If they're eating foods they're sensitive to. Um, if you are uh, burdened by environmentals, maybe BPA, benzenes or whatever that's causing an inflammatory process, whatever it is, that's creating a low level of inflammation in your body can create oxidative stress. Now that's one picture. Let me talk about the other picture and then we'll put them together. So the mitochondria naturally and normally is making reactive oxygen species just as a normal thing that it does for normal metabolism. That's normal, but we make enough energy, we kind of negate that. But if you have extra oxidative stress, then all of your flavonoids, all of your antioxidants, your glutathione, all those things get depleted and you can't really stamp out this fire and stamp out that fire at the same time. And so the mitochondrial function becomes compromised because you can't get rid of all these reactive oxygen species. So those are three biggies that's just really going to pull that mitochondrial function down. And I appreciate that. So uh, circle back real quick to uh, blood sugars. I think metabolic syndrome is a huge, huge part of what you and all your peers see a lot of, right? There's it's true sugar consumption, carbohydrate consumption is so, so high. So uh, are you, say, addressing the mitochondrial dysfunction or addressing the insulin sensitivity or both? Or how would you say, I love your questions because, yeah, it's both. Okay. So, so from a systems biology point, this is the reason why I like this in our wheelhouse is because when people come in, we're going to look for factors that foundationally affect their physiology. And when we do that, this all goes right into that mitochondria. And yes, one begets the other. If you have insulin resistance, you're going to start tearing down mitochondrial function. But when you have mitochondrial function, now you can't handle sugars properly. So that it just becomes this, this, whole, this whole cycle. So yeah, it's very good. Now, 
I did want to say when somebody has blood sugar dysregulation and 90% of the patients I have walk into my door have some level of it. Now they might not be diabetic and they might be not be diagnosed as hypoglycemic, but they're somewhere on the scale that we have to work on. It's not the only thing going on, but it's one of those things. If you don't like somebody has blood sugar dysregulation and you don't address that and you don't get that stabilized, um, good luck on really getting them uh, back to health because you, this is the basic foundation. And this is one of the reasons why it's a basic foundation because the mitochondria have to be on board with you if you're going to get well. So, so blood sugar dysregulation, anemia, anything causing oxygen. Let's say somebody has asthma or lung disease. This could cause mitochondrial breakdown because if you have lung disease, you're not going to get proper oxygenation. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, we talked about that. Low blood pressure. This is a big one. People who have low blood sugar, if I can just say this quickly, mm -hmm. people who have low blood sugar, the brain needs sugar and oxygen, unless you're on a ketogenic diet, burning ketones, the brain needs glucose and oxygen for fuel in the brain. When glucose goes down, your pituitary sends an alarm to the adrenals to kick out cortisol because cortisol very quickly gets sugar and oxygen to the brain. Now, here's the deal. Cortisol modulates three main functions in the body. It modulates your blood sugar, it modulates your blood pressure, and it modulates your immune system. Now, people think of, well, cortisol raises blood sugar. Well, it does, but cortisol is more important than that. It actually modulates your blood sugar. If you cannot, and when you get a, a true adrenal fatigue and you just can't kick out cortisol, these are people, no matter what, they always have low blood pressure and low blood sugar. Even doing you know, liver things and eating on time and this and that, they're always fighting this until that system is upright. And it's a very important concept because cortisol, when it begins waning, by the way, you can tell if you have waning cortisol, one thing, is your blood pressure lower than 110 over 70? Either one of them. If you're 100 over 70 or you're 110 over 60, this is low blood pressure. There's not enough oomph in the blood pressure to, uh, to perfuse the oxygen into the base of the brain. You start having low blood pressure, you're going to have low oxygen throughout. So that's another thing. For mitochondria, we talk about blood sugar and oxygen, also chronic inflammation, chronic infections. How's that GI tract running? How's your hormones working? Uh, what's your toxic burden? All of these things can negatively impact the mitochondria. Right. And isn't cortisol going to really protect fat at the expense of muscle, leading to other issues? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then with sugar, uh, blood sugar dysregulation, uh, it, wouldn't there be years and years and years of pancreas working overtime to produce more and more insulin to keep that blood sugar looking normal? That's part of the process. Right, right. So, so when you look at insulin resistance, there's a, uh, there's a, a process that takes place of the breakdown of those insulin receptors. So when you think about it, ins insulin resistance is a breakdown of your insulin receptors. So you know, when insulin touches the insulin receptors, there's about 300 to 500 of these little receptors on the outside of like your liver cells, uh, muscle cells and fat cells. Well, insulin touches one of those receptors that opens the gateway and, and for the sugar to go in now, but over time, there are three or four things that we know of for sure that will cause a breakdown of those, uh, receptors. And one of those is, I think you brought it out, just eating too much sugar, like just you know, you're too many insulin surges because you're eating too much sugar. That's one thing. If you have chronic inflammation in your body, you could eat a perfect diet and have chronic inflammation and it will drive insulin resistance and cause this blood sugar dysregulation. You could have a perfect blood sugar diet and have a really poor or a very, a, 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 a microbiome that's not very diverse. And which that's what shows the kind of the strength of the microbiome, how diverse it is. If you have a microbiome that's not very diverse, uh, you're not going to have the signaling you need for good, uh, uh, good insulin connection with that. So you could have poor microbiome, you could have chronic inflammation, or some genetics are involved, uh, eating too much sugar, all of these things can combine together at some level and cause a breakdown. And you're exactly right. There's a varying degree of how far this goes. And over time, you have to pump out more and more and more insulin. And when insulin goes up, 
For a man, testosterone goes down, estrogen goes up. When insulin goes up for a woman, testosterone goes up, estrogen goes down, progesterone goes down. It messes all the thyroid, uh, the thyroid hormones as well, but it messes up all the hormones. So I would say insulin is like the it factor. It's the hormone that bumps all the rest of the hormones out of, out of whack, if you will. Very good. So you touched on brain uh, briefly a few minutes okay. ago. So is there a neurological aspect to this? How does mitochondrial dysfunction affect the brain? Oh, wow. That's really good. So uh, two, of the, two of the organs in your body, and you know, if you don't have a heart, you're not going to be living very well, right? If you don't have a set of lungs, you're not going to be living very well. So I don't want to have that argument. But I would, say, I would argue that two organs in the body are the highest level of physiological function, and that would be your brain and your liver. Your brain and liver are processing things like crazy with a capital K. So they're doing a lot of work, right? So now your muscles are also a system that are doing a lot of work. So anything that's doing a lot of work needs a lot of energy. Anything doing a lot of energy needs a lot of good mitochondrial function. So one of the things that we actually see is um, there's something called uh, BDNF, you know, brain-derived neurotropic uh, factors. And we also have SART3s, which are types of enzymes that will help protect the mitochondria, but also protect the cell. And, uh, but these things, if, if uh, we don't have these things working well, we have big uh, breakdown of the mitochondria in the brain. And so if the brain starts losing mitochondria, you start losing neuron health. And this right here is smack dab in the middle of neurodegenerative diseases. And let me say this, neurodegenerative diseases and neurodegeneration are two different things. Neurodegeneration is, an, is not a defined disease like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, not this unremitting disease that's just chewing like a cogwheel right on down the road. But neurodegeneration is simply neurons that are not healthy because they have poor mitochondria that are breaking down. What causes them to break down? All the things that we've been talking about up to this point. Exercise is also, I didn't say that a while ago, but exercise is also key along with blood sugar regulation. How's that oxygen? Um, getting inflammation under control, um, you know, dealing with these chronic infections, making sure the liver's working good. Autophagy is a big subject. Um, mitophagy is a big subject. Um, you know, good hormones, uh, toxic, you know, toxic burden reduced, all these things build good mitochondria. And these are all basic physiological things that when any patient walks in my door, no matter what's going on with them, I'm going to check these bases. I want to know what's that blood sugar doing. I want to know what's that oxygen doing. They have anemia. Are they moving their body? Do they have a lung disease? Do they have something preventing them to have, do they have low blood pressure? Do they have something preventing good oxygen? I want to know, do they have chronic inflammation? I want to know, do you have a chronic infection? I want to know how that liver's working. I want to know what the microbiome looks like. Basics of digestion. How's that HCL, digestive enzymes, bile flow? I want to know those things. I want to know what your hormones look like. This is kind of a picture of what we say. Now, Steve, if I may. You may. I coined, I coined a, uh, an acronym years ago when I first started teaching DAPSI work. And I called it bail them out. I called it bail them out. And what bail them out stands for is B stands for blood sugar, sugar regulation. B is for blood sugar. B is also for body balance. That's our chiropractic work. Don't forget good chiropractic work. A stands for anemia, but I really uh, believe that should be oxygen, but I would rather bail them out than boil them out. So <laughs> I kept bail them out. So it just really means oxygen. I stands for inflammation. The other I stands for infection. The L stands for liver GI. So you have to make sure liver's good and GI is good. E stands for environmentals like toxins. E stands for things like estrogens, hormones. M stands for methylation, stands for microbiome, um, these things. So, so I developed this acronym so that it's a checklist. When somebody comes into my office, I'm going to go through this checklist. Why do I love talking about mitochondria? Because this checklist goes right into the mitochondria, and it's the mitochondria that's majorly being affected when these things aren't working properly. 
Very good. So a uh, quick rabbit hole, try to keep it brief. Keep Please. This, uh, but you mentioned autophagy. Uh, yes. And again, I, I think you really uh, touched on a hot topic today in, in natural health. Uh, in autophagy, uh, do we agree that it's, it's uh, triggered or stimulated by fasting? Yeah. And if so, how do you define a fast and for how long to trigger autophagy? Okay. Autophagy is a wonderful subject because there's a lot of programs out there. And we say this, we say, let's do a liver detox. I, I understand that. And I'm not going to try to change our vernacular on that. Uh, but detoxification of the liver really takes place through autophagy. Detoxification of the brain really takes care of, takes place during autophagy. There has to be some things in place for good autophagy. And Steve, you have, you have hit the nail smack dab on, you know, you've hit it right on the head. So, so here's the deal. And I'll just give you an example. And this is what I suggest patients do at the very least, do not eat your heaviest meal at night. If you eat a heavy meal at night, especially, especially putting a big, you know, meat meal, a big protein meal at night, going to bed three hours later, that thing is still rattling around in your GI tract. Instead of your liver being able to clean itself properly through the night and even the brain to clean itself properly at night, you have to deal with the food in the GI tract. So you want to have your lightest meal at night so that your body can do proper autophagy. You also want to make sure that you have your sleep-wake cycle going well. You have to sleep good for good autophagy as well. So all of these things have to be in place. Now, going to your fasting, there's different ways to define fasting, intermittent fasting. I like intermittent fasting. What intermittent fasting is in my, in my view about book is having a window through the day that you're eating and a window that you're not. So the window that you eat, uh, you can make that a six hour window and have an 18 hour window that you're not eating. Now, what I would say, if you've never done this before, you want to start off with at least a 12 hour window and then go to 14 hours, 16 hours. Um, if you have patients who are hypoglycemic, they are not good candidates for intermittent fasting. You first have to stabilize blood sugar if it's hypoglycemic so that they can withstand the fast. If you can convert people from fat, from sugar burners, in other words, eating a lot of carbohydrates, if you can convert them into fat burners, then they're burning ketones and they're not so ravagingly hungry in between meals. So it makes it easier for them to do that. Now, for me, the meal, I like to skip for intermittent fasting. Everybody has different opinions on this, but I like to skip the dinner meal. Now, if you have family and this is your get together time with your family, you might need to make different arrangements. Uh, you might skip breakfast. I have an issue with skipping breakfast with most people because breakfast sets the tone for the blood sugar for the day. So I don't really like to skip breakfast, but I would say this, if you have family or you have social things you want to do in the evening, but you still want to do this, then I would intermittent fast. You don't have to do it every day. So you can pick a day on Thursday. I'm going out with friends. Okay, go ahead and do that. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, you did your intermittent fasting. So yeah, intermittent fasting is key. Also, you said not rabbit trail, but here we go. Also, overeating. Overeating will tear down the mitochondria as fast as anything other than toxic burden. So overeating is a killer to good mitochondrial function. Intermittent fasting, the mitochondria loves it. So I think we have our topic for our next talk. <laughs> yes, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, I should say one more thing, Steve. Yes. Mitophagy is a takeoff from autophagy. Okay. Mitophagy is this. There's a normal clearing of mitochondria within the cell. It's called mitophagy, and it's how the cell gets rid of um, old, decaying, uh, not working properly my, mitochondria. And it's good to do that because you create too much reactive oxygen species when your mitochondria are not functioning properly. So there's a process called mitophagy that will actually, as a quality control, will help you keep good, healthy mitochondria in there. Exercise is probably the, and autophagy are the two big things that drive good, healthy mitophagy. 
does exercise drive the mitophagy? Yes, absolutely. It, you want mitophagy because you want to clear out old, bad, broken down mitochondria. So you're not building up too much reactive oxygen species. So fasting will drive autophagy and exercise absolutely. Will drive mitophagy. That's exactly right. And let me say this, intermittent fasting will also help with the mitophagy as well. Okay. There's a process that goes on. Oh my goodness. You got, you opened the small rabbit hole next. <laughs> that'll be our next interview. <laughs> no, okay. All right. We'll sell this, but I do want to say this. All right. So there's something the mitochondria do that's called fission and fusion. Fission is where mitochondria divide and you make new ones. Mm -hmm. Fusion is where you get two mitochondria combined together. Both of them are important for good, healthy mitochondrial health. When you intermittent fast, what happens is the mitochondria that are there will start joining together so they can have more efficiency and their ability to take energy because they haven't seen energy in a while. And they're going to be like, we're going to get more efficient at processing this energy. Okay. There's a lot more we could talk about, yes. but I, I think, I, I think you have a time limit on your, on your <laughs> interviews. Well, I, yeah, I just want, I, I want to keep it uh, maybe to an hour or less or so, but yeah, we could do a real deep dive uh, because fasting and all the hormonal changes that take place, the, the stem cells, the immune system, I mean, so many good things happen. So I think that would positive be great, momentum, right? Dive for, but I know you touched on autophagy. There is a connection to the mitochondria and we kind of already got into this next question, but I want to get into a little bit of um, the the cause of mitochondrial dysfunction and speak to how much of it is genetic, if it's genetic at all, uh, versus diet, lifestyle, nutrition, and medication. I know that's a big question. You might be here for the next half hour okay. or so, but uh, right. yeah. So genetic causes versus diet, lifestyle, nutrition, med medicine. Uh, clear some. Okay. Of that. Well, let's let's talk about. It. Let's break it down. Okay. So one. Yeah, for sure. From my understanding, you actually get your mitochondria from your mom. So, so mitochondria, there are some genetic plays in that. That's just no question about it. There's going to be genetic plays. What we learned from the microbiome project was that going into the project, we really felt like we didn't, but the body of science uh, thought that whether you get a disease or not was 70, 80% genetics. And you had about 20 30% of things that you could do to modulate. After the microbiome project where they really, you know, looked at the genes and saw the sequencing and they saw this promoter region that was really doing everything, what they found was diet, exercise, stress level, toxic burden, structural integrity, sleep issues, all of these things played into what was called the promoter region. And these things actually determine how your genes express so now we no longer think 70 as a body of science. I never thought this. We didn't. But as a body of science, 70, 80 uh, percent was thought to be genetic. Now we say 78 percent, maybe 90 percent is what you do. So, yeah, there's genetic stuff to mitochondria, but you have to just work with what you're doing. I'm not dealing with I'm not talking about mitochondrial diseases. That's a different basket. There's not really a lot you can do for mitochondrial diseases from a functional medicine standpoint, you can help things around the edges. And I certainly wouldn't, you know, decline a patient that had mitochondrial disease. We'd work on what best it can, but that's a different, different category. Okay. So as far as diet, just a couple of things. One, don't overeat. Two, convert yourself from a sugar burner to a fat burner. You might even do well uh, doing intermittent phases of ketogenic diet. Uh, I like the modified paleo style uh, diet if you're not doing ketogenic mediterranean is okay watch the carbs uh, you know that's just my you know my take on that so so that that would be a dietary thing another thing dietarily find out what foods you're sensitive to if you're eating foods that you're sensitive to this is going to cause too much inflammation in your system it's going to cause mitochondrial breakdown pay attention to the times that you eat if you're hypoglycemic you need to eat more meals um, 70, 80%, this is my opinion, 70, 80% of people with hypoglycemia have liver problems. They just need to deal with that. There's another 20, 30% that's coming from the base of the brain, coming from neuro uh, neurological things, coming from other issues you have to deal with. So okay. those are kind of the dietary packages. Now we know nutritional things, you know, we know alpha lipoic acid, um, cofactors, we know CoQ10, we know L-carnitine, glutathione, magnesium, riboflavin, your B vitamins, all of these are big players as it comes to 
cofactors, and we certainly need those. I don't talk about those a lot, and I've talked about this in the beginning because I don't want somebody tuning into a mitochondrial talk and walk away and say, oh, all I need to do is take alpha poic acid and CoQ10 and L-carnitine, I'm good to go. It, right. it's, it's more complex than that. But should you do that? Yes. Another thing you should do nutritionally is this. If you have a major over, overburden um, from your mitochondria and you want to rebuild them, you want to load them up on antioxidants, some curcumin, resveratrol, glutathione. These are all good hitters. Make sure they're eating anything with berry at the end of the name, blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, all these good berries. They're full of phytonutrients, flavonoids. You need to be rich in those so you can take the burden of the reaction oxygen species that you're making so the mitochondria can start being healthy. So those are some things I would say from a nutritional standpoint that are important. Uh, glutathione, I, I said that, so that's good. Exercise, got to move your body. You have to move. If you don't move it, you lose it. it. You have to move your body. There's no, and you have to move your brain. Uh, don't sit there and just watch TV all day, right? Get active, read a book, go out and, and smell the park, go out and do whatever. Just move your body. Get on a trampoline, uh, go exercise, move your body. You have kids, they have ADHD, they got to move their bodies. You got to, you got to move, move, move the body. Toxic burden is a big one. Some people are more susceptible than others. Don't drink hot liquid out of water bottles. And don't drink a bunch of water out of those plastic water bottles, right? Um, if you're drinking coffee, those plastic lids, right? Well, sorry about that. Plastic <laughs> lids. It's, if you have a one-off, that's fine. Right. But this is day in and day out exposure to BPA. This sure. is not good for us. You're, you're filling up your gas tank with gas. Don't sit there and sniff the gas, right? Ah. Diesel smoke, all these things. Can, can, can break down our mitochondria. Uh, hormones, make sure your hormones are good. If you're, by the way, if you have low mitochondria, you're gonna have low hormones. If you have low hormones, it's gonna make you have low mitochondria. So you gotta make sure that your hormones are good. How do you make sure your hormones are good? First, work through that Balaam out model first. Don't start just putting hormones in before you stabilize the Balaam out. These are really the big factors that are gonna have big plays there's more than this, but these are, this is enough to chew on. I think these, okay. these are some take homes. Uh, any common medicines that would play a role? Thank you. I forgot about that one. <clears throat> well, we know that statins cause myopathies, right? Muscle things. Well, what is it doing? It's tearing down mitochondria. So statins, antidepressants, uh, anti-diabetics, metformins, um, anti-diuretics, some antibiotics will do it. Um, aspirin will do it, some other types of painkillers. So guess what? If you throw, uh, a, you know, if you throw, you know, a bunch of golf balls up in a room, right. With a crowd, you're going to hit about 12 people on one or more of these drugs, right? Cause everybody's on these drugs. In fact, there's a, there's a play. I, I have some functional doctors. I still take them on. I have some functional doctors that make this statement and I understand why. If a patient comes in with polypharmacy, they do not automatically take them on as a patient. They say, you're too far gone. I'm sorry, you don't fit my model. I understand this. Now, it's not that they're not compassionate, but my thing is I try to just let them know in the beginning, okay, you're on 12 different things. This is not a quick fix. This is gonna be difficult for you to get to where you need to be, but you just need to know what's going on. Polypharmacy is terrible on the mitochondria it leads to chronic degenerative diseases. Appreciate that. So we're talking about mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, we're in the uh, holistic, natural healthcare yes. side of the world. Uh, is this uh, something, is this, even, is, is this even recognized by allopathic traditional medicine? Would my, would my general practitioner uh, even use the term mitochondrial dysfunction? Well, I'll just say my 11-year-old daughter did. So that's <laughs> something. Right? Right, right. So, right, right, right. but what I would say is this. Okay. So this is a functional thing that we're dealing with. Okay. Looking at the mitochondria, we're working more on the cause side of issues and not the effect side. So your traditional medical doctor is not working with cause. They're working with the effect. Somebody has high blood pressure. They give them a pill. Somebody goes, you know, whatever. Right. So they're not really working with cause so much. Now, some of them are good and some of them mm -hmm. do, but they're not really working with cause. Now, if you stated the question and say, do traditional 
researchers know about this. I'm going to say in spades. Absolutely. This is the talk of the town. This is what's going on. So, and I would also say back to our approach, you know, systems biology approach. I like talking about the mitochondria because when you talk about the mitochondria and in supporting mitochondrial health, you begin separating what I would call the traditional medical model from really what we do. Now, let me talk just briefly about this. Uh, and, and I'm not disparaging any model. I'm just saying we need to look at the models. The medical model, traditional, is built upon the infectious disease model. Back in the 1800s, uh, most people that died, died from infection, right? So the advent of antibiotics saved many, many, many lives in World War II. World War I, most people died from infections. So World War II, they did not die from infections, and it was a great thing. But it became this thing that they found, oh, you have a bug, we have a drug, pharmaceutical companies popped up all over the place. And we got this model that if you have this, you take that. Well, that model was never changed out. And so when they came to chronic degenerative diseases, that same model is largely in play. You have high cholesterol, here's a statin. You have high blood pressure, here's a beta blocker and a diuretic, anti-diuretic, or whatever the case may be. So we're still working in the traditional circles with that. So they're working with the effect side, and those are all effect side. In the systems biology approach, we recognize that there's more than one thing. That's why there'll never be a drug that solves Alzheimer's. There never will be because it's multimodal. We know of at least 36 things that drive Alzheimer's. We have to look at the multimodal approach. Multimodal approach fits perfectly into this conversation about mitochondria. Thank you for that. I hope I didn't stall you out. Yeah, no, I mean, pe people, you know, uh, it's going to be mostly practitioners that, that hear this, but there may be some consumers that, that hear this as well. Oh, perfect. Uh, so uh, can you talk about any specific, uh, whether that be specific, you know, examples, your personal experience, any case studies? Can you talk about how you maybe have um, identified a patient with mitochondrial dysfunction and what that patient care model looked like and maybe some outcomes? Certainly. Okay. So what I would say is um, not to be overgeneralizing, but I would say that nearly every patient I have come in fits into this model, especially if there are two categories, one chronic degenerative disease, they come in, they have diabetes, they have cardiovascular disease, they have the autoimmune disorder or whatever the case may be. That's one model. And the, I'm sorry, that's one basket. And the other basket of folks would be people that I would call in between the ditches. They don't, um, they don't have a defined disease. They just don't feel good, right? They're tired. Uh, they got extra weight to get rid of. They can't think as clear as they used to. They can't sleep as good as they used to. The digestive tract doesn't work as well. Um, and so, so in these two baskets of folks, mitochondrial dysfunction is always going to be what we're working with. Now, there are things that I will look at in the blood that will give me some kind of idea. I can look at things uh, around the muscles. Um, I can do a body fat analysis. My instrument that I use for body fat always also gives me muscle mass. Muscle mass is very important. You should be 34 to 41% muscle mass. If you're lower than that, I'm sorry. So what device are you using? Is it a DEXA scan or something else? It's the RG, RJ, RGL, RJL device. Okay. I apologize, but we originally purchased it from Numedica. Okay. So it was a device that you guys were using and we actually purchased it from you guys. So okay. I think it's RGL. Okay. I don't know. Somebody okay. will have to answer that for us, but okay. So, so yeah, but you can use a DEXA. Okay. Anything that will allow you, uh, you might even be able to get a Tanita scale that has that function, but I like to look at muscle mass okay. because if you have low muscle mass, guess what? You got low cut mitochondria, right? Right. So when you are doing a basic, there's a grip strength test. It's called a dynamometer. Dynamometer. All right. Try to spell that fast. <laughs> right. Save there's a, something called a dynamometer that you have a grip strength. There's normative data that shows us, for instance, if you're 45 to 50 year old female, you should be able to pull on the right side 62 pounds, left side 57 on three average pulls. Mm -hmm. So if you're not, if you don't have grip strength, 
That's a sign of low protein. Another thing, look on your blood test. On a blood test, there's a value called creatinine. When creatinine goes below 0.7, that's a sign of low protein in the muscles. So these are three things that you can actually look at for low protein. If you have low protein, you're going to have low mitochondria. Now, let me say this. All of those could be normal and you could have low mitochondria. So it's a rule in test, not necessarily a rule out test. So, but there's not a lot of good uh, clinical things that you, other than those things that you can put your finger on and say, oh, that's what that is. You just recognize when somebody has chronic fatigue, uh, they can't get past a virus, they can't get past uh, a Lyme disease, they're chronically you know, sick, uh, this kind of thing, you're gonna know they have breakdown in the, in the mitochondria. And I would say for case study, because we just see this all the time, when you see somebody responding, they're feeling better, they're getting their energy back, we know their mitochondria is reviving. Very good. I, th I thank you, Doctor. This is a, a pretty deep dive, and I think a, a subject matter that's not often discussed. At you know, in this no, level. good. What do you hope uh, practitioners hearing this now that they may be pharmacists, MDs, DOs, chiropractors, naturopaths, uh, uh, acupuncturists? What do you hope? This is this is your material. This is your your uh, your presentation today. What do you hope another practitioner would take away from this discussion? Okay, so the mitochondria is a good thing to understand in relationship to human physiology. For the doctor out there seeing patients, I'm going to say there are a few basic things, no matter what the patient has going on, that we need to pay attention to from a very foundational physiological standpoint, that if we don't pay attention to them, the mitochondria can't get better. If the mitochondria can't get better, the patient's not getting better. And I've outlined some of these, blood sugar, uh, how's their oxygen? What's their inflammatory load look like? Do they have chronic infections? How's the liver working? How's the GI tract? How's the microbiome? These are just bit, these are things are very basic things that if you can work on. Now, let's take it home for the person who's not the doctor. The person who is just sitting out there, they happen on this and say, what the heck am I doing? Listen to these two doctors or talking about mitochondria, right? I, I just couldn't sleep in the middle of the night and here I am trying to find something to help me go to sleep, right? right. <laughs> well, for you guys, here's what I'm going to say. Quit eating so much sugar, right? Put the sugar down, right? Start eating better food, organics. Start moving your body. Pay attention to your sleep cycles. There's a lot of reasons for people not sleeping, but the two most common ones are blood sugar dysregulation, hormonal imbalance. So you got to work on those things. Best place to start is the liver. How can you take care of the liver? Eat good foods. Don't, eat, you know, if it comes in a box, if it comes in a bag, if it comes in the can, you want to limit it. You want to shop in the perimeter of this grocery store where the vegetables and the meats are, right? You want to stay kind of in those categories. Reduce your toxic burden. Don't use a lot of plastic. Um, uh, also, what I would say is, if, you, if you're not hypoglycemic, get into this intermittent fasting. This is a really good thing for you to do. So there's other things, but those would be good places to start. Dr. Robert Kessinger, I really appreciate your time today. This has been incredible. I look forward to our next talk. I think we already have our topic. <laughs> and so uh, let me let, I'll, let you, I'll let you close it out here. It's been, it's been a great hour. Again, really appreciate your time. I know your schedule is packed and you were kind enough, uh, generous enough to squeeze us in here today. So uh, I'll let you take it home. Close us out. Well, I have to say that I have enjoyed being, I, really, I have enjoyed being with you, Steve. Uh, I thought you did a fantastic job of really guiding the conversation to pull as much out as we could get. Uh, it takes a skilled interviewer to do that. And I think you did a great job. And uh, God bless and thank you so much. Thank you, doctor.